Amen. In our presentation yesterday, we began to lay out the steps of salvation um, upon a line. And we wanted to finish that. Chapter 3, 
through. Do we remember that? We spent some time looking at that. Speaks about looking in this mirror. Reflecting the glory of God. We discussed that at some length. And I think it's important for us to understand. Because in that story, it brought the concept of what? That was causing problems to this heart. What was the problem? Do you remember? Verse 13. And not as Moses, which put a veil. Remember the veil? So it's spoken about a gross heart, a fat heart. A heart that has a veil over it. This is ears but not hearing, eyes but not seeing, having a heart that is unable to perceive what's going on. Then we went to. Okay, so we had that this was Ezekiel 37, the second prophesying. Yesterday we spoke about. This double-edged sword. And this one's where? Hebrews? 412. Over and over again, I want us to see that what we would consider morality, many familiar passages from both the Old and the New Testament, are nothing more than a reiteration of what we teach in our message. To put these things on a line, is addressing the experience that we have at these particular waymarks. One thing that I tend to, at least, if not discussing any detail, I'd like to just make this point at most presentations that I do. We talk about the line. Find a symbol of. So let's put equal here. This line is a symbol of what? Reform line. What is that a symbol of? Yeah, the last gospel. <coughs> History. God's dealing with redemption of his people. So there's all good answers, and what I've noticed is you're given the answers that we've discussed this week. So I know that we're all beginning to see things in a similar way, which I'm really happy about. So I would normally do this at the beginning, which is why everybody's got the, sort of not answer, the wrong answer, not the answer I wanted us to see. So we could go to Isaiah chapter 28 to understand what this line was. What verse would we go to? 17. Good, we are familiar with this. So now what is this line of symbol of? Judgment. Judgment. And where does judgment begin? Good. Begins here at the beginning, and it ends here at the end. So this whole line is a line of judgment. So where does judgment begin? Time at the end. And it ends above the probation. Relatively straightforward. So if this is the line of judgment, what is this line? Plummet. Threat? Plummet. Plummet. And it's a symbol of what? Righteousness. Let's turn to Isaiah 28, verse 17, because maybe some of us are not familiar with this. Plummet, 
and the house shall sweep away the refuge of lies, and the waters shall overflow the hiding place. So in the context of Isaiah 28, what is this hail and the overflowing waters? In the context of Isaiah 28. We should also always go to the literal, shouldn't we? Before we make any kind of application. What's it referring to? Sorry? Someone says that I didn't want to hear, can hear the answer. Okay, so I'll ask the same question. Let's go to verse 2. Behold, the Lord hath the mighty and strong one, which as a tempest of hail and a destroying storm, as a flood of mighty waters overflowing, shall cast down to the earth with the hand. Who is that? Assyrian. It's the Assyrians, yes? Do we all understand that it's the Assyrians? We won't make much more application on that, but when we think about the application of these verses, these chapters, we should always think about where they're placed in history. So we know that Isaiah 28 is in the same history, the same time period as Isaiah 7. From Isaiah 7 all the way to 28, it's this history just before the destruction of the ten tribes. So, I just added that bit in for information purposes. So this is the line of righteousness, yes? And what's this one then? Also a line of righteousness. Every single one of these way marks are lines of righteousness. So when we begin to understand what Reform Line is dealing with, it's dealing with judgment, and at each way mark there should be what? An experience of righteousness. What would produce that righteous experience? It's the test or the events that are occurring in that history. Yes? So we want to understand that when we talk about reform lines, when we talk about the prophetic gospel, what's the difference between the prophetic gospel and the moral gospel? The events. Just the events. Because God requires 100% obedience without question for Christians. Who's allowed to ask questions? The Gentiles, sinners. Are Adventists Gentile sinners? Yes, they are. Because they've all done sin. There's no difference between them. Paul emphasises this point because he wants to show a distinction between what is what God is now doing compared to the existing state of affairs in the church. Something new is happening and he wants this demarcation to be clearly understood. So he's going to classify the church as being considered as Gentiles in the sight of God. And they're allowed to ask questions. That's why we can patiently bear with them. We can reason together with them because their sins are like scarlet. But when it comes to us, sorry, we're not, I'm not taking questions. So when it comes to us, we're not allowed to ask questions. We have to do and die. No questions in an army. 100% obedience. So these events, they produce a righteous experience in an individual from the very beginning. Righteousness comes from the word right, which is the opposite of wrong. And when God looks at you and you're wrong, you must have done something wrong. If you're doing something wrong, you're not doing his will, which means you're doing sin. So when is the sin problem dealt with? In a reform life. <clears throat> right at the beginning. Because righteousness is being exhibited at the very beginning, all the way to the end. So I want us to think about 
When we talk about what a reform line is supposed to do, and where we're supposed to put sin out of our lives, reform line is not really dealing with sin. Because the sin problem gets dealt with back here. In the conversion process, are you working through sin? One day you're sinning, one day you're not. Go from 10 to 9 to 8, reduction of sin. Is that what the process of conversion is? No. It certainly cannot be. Even if your experience teaches you that it might look like that, a reform line teaches you otherwise. This is why God has instructed us to place the experience of a movement, of his people, of Eve, on a reform line so we can get this really clear in our minds. Once you can behold the truth, it should do what? Change you. By beholding, you become changed. It's by beholding reform lines and understanding what they're teaching that you can begin to become changed. So, we've put that thought, that concept in place that this reform line is a process of how sin is dealt with at a corporate level but also it should teach us how we're supposed to respond to God on an individual level. We've discussed that sin is a choice not an issue of nature. We've got that in place. We've got conversion is a process. By 911 we're justified. When you're justified you become the labour and you live a life set apart for holy use, which we call what? Sanctification. So now we're going to live a sanctified life until you die. We come off dead at midnight. We're considering the line of the priests. We could go to Daniel chapter 10. In Daniel chapter 10, when Daniel has a confrontation with Christ, he falls to the ground with no bread, symbol of death. When Jacob meets his assailant, the angel, when does he meet him? At midnight, the brook Jabbok, and he has to face death. He comes face to face with death. Right here. We can mark death here. So there's his sanctified life until you come to the point of death. read this to us at the very beginning of her presentations the finishing touches of immortality which we call glorification justification sanctification and glorification now I've brought justification here as a point but all of this is a process of a person being justified which is why we mark the first, second, and third steps as justification, sanctification, and glorification. I want us to remember the point that we made. The glorification is not just dealing with our houses, with our bodies. Often we think about it in terms of that. The second advent, mortality will put on immortality. But there's two things to address. There's the internal or spiritual and there's the external or physical. And the finishing touches of immortality begin to take their, their effect in the binding of. We understand that this is the binding of. And the binding of is a long, drawn out process. 
not done in a moment. Correctly so, we've developed a theology in our movement that deals with the binding of of the priests, the Levites, and the eleventh hour workers or Nethanims. Why do we like to call the eleventh hour workers or the Gentiles Nethanims? Why do we emphasize that point? <coughs> we have three models, remember? The three models are agriculture, marriage, and buildings. And what building is this? The temple. And in a temple, you need certain people to work. You need priests, Levites, and 11th hour workers aren't much good. But what you do need is definite, or people to do all the manual work, if you can express it that way, which is what their role was. So the reason we add this emphasis on the symbol of nephilims is because we want, us, we want to remember that this is a story about the temple. This is not a story about the building of a temple, but the maintenance and care of this temple and its use. You need all three groups to make a temple work properly. Or we could call this the restoration of the temple, or the temple services. So we'd have the binding off of the priests, the binding off of the Levites, and the binding off of the 11th hour workers. Where would we mark, what would this way mark be? What did someone say? This one here. This one, yeah. Someone say 911. Well, forgive me. Okay, so if this is midnight, we'd say this is midnight cry. This is midnight cry, what would this be? Sunday law, and then this would be close of probation. What I want us to see is that once the binding law starts, there's no break, it continues on. We mark this as the third step, don't we? So once the third step begins, it flows through as a continuum. So when does the binding off end? End here? Thread? Where Michael stands. That's where Michael stands here. This is Daniel 12 1. Identified in scripture as 
Jacob's time of trouble. Bringing us back to the story of Jacob. So this would be Patriarchs and Prophets, 196, paragraph 3. We'll put that here. <coughs> Patriarchs and Prophets, 196, paragraph 3. It was a lonely mountainous region, the haunt of wild beasts and the lurking place of robbers and murderers. Solitary and unprotected, Jacob bowed in deep distress upon the earth. It was midnight. All that made life dear to him were at a distance, exposed to danger and death. So we can mark death here. And what time of day is it? So here's midnight. And we also said that this was midnight. So you can see that there's death marked here, which is the same death that we've been speaking about here. And it says that all that made life dear to him were at a distance. What makes life dear to a man? His wife, his children, his car, his bank account, his wealth. All those earthly things that are dear to him, they're all at a distance. So can he lean upon anybody? No. And what phrase do we use in this history? Every earthly support is cut off. So that's why we get where we get this concept there, every earthly support is cut off. So in this history here, Jacob's time of trouble, <coughs> which is what we're discussing, who's going through this experience here? What group of people are identified as going through this experience? The 144,000. If we had the time, we'd go through some of this history and we'd see that this history here from close of probation, second admin, is also a what? Finding off for who? 144,000. So we've got four binding offs. What happens after the second advent? So we've got another binding off here during the millennium. So we'll put the second advent to the third advent. I'll put the thousand years here. So we know that this is also a binding off. So what I want us to see by doing that is this theory, this concept that we've developed about binding offs of the priest, Levites and Ethanins, the creation of Midnight Midnight Cry. All of this is based upon standard Adventist theology. It's nothing strange or new. It's just a refinement and development of truth essential to our time. Because this idea and concept of the Bible law here, the 144,000, even though we don't use the word binding off as Adventist, but the word binding off, dictionary definition means what? Conclusion. The final work, the finishing touches. So this concept or idea of the binding off is not new. It's something that we should all understand, and not only that, 
We also understand that there's a binding off here during the millennium. The reason why I want us to see this in this light is because often we think that this binding off experience here for the priest, the binding off of the priest, by the time you get to midnight cry, everything is all sorted out. It's all done and dusted. A priest, what nationality is he? Jew or Hebrew, yes? Adventist. A Levite? And 11th hour workers. Gentiles. I'm almost going to call them dogs, but I think people would misunderstand. Can I call them dogs? <laughs> Who's in charge? SBAs? Or Gentiles. The master who eats at the table or the dogs that get the crumbs. The master. Who's the master? Yes, the SDAs are the masters, aren't they? Yes? And who's the master of the masters? This one or this one? Priests. So did we come across this concept before about the higher and the lower ones? SDA is a higher, Gentiles are lower. Two groups, higher and lower. Higher powers, lower powers. But the higher powers come in two parts. We were discussing this one of my brothers who came to this observation during the week. And it happens over and over again in many different ways. So I want us to see that this idea of higher and lower powers, the threefold nature of a human being, is wrapped up in our reform message, in our reform line. These concepts and ideas are repeated over and over again. Because God's dealing with men are ever the same, these are wheels within wheels. And just at a basic level, God wants us, wants us to be sure that we have enough faith that what we're teaching is correct. They're not wild and crazy ideas. The nature of man is not fourfold or twofold or fivefold. It's threefold. Over and over again we see this. How many messages are there? Three messages. But the first and second can, can be considered singular message. And then you have the third, which in and of itself is a repeat of the first and second. So then you can understand this idea of three and two over and over again. So if these are SDAs, and these are SDAs, and these are Gentiles, who are these? Who are the 144,000? You are sure on that? So... If they're all SDAs, where did they come from? Which SDAs are they? Are they a new group that came from somewhere? They must be because it's the same reform line. They must be the same group of people. The only SDAs that you've got are priests and Levites. So what's that teaching us? If you're a priest, you're going to go through a binding off here, and also, a binding off here. Can we conceptualise that? So if you think everything's finished here, you need to think again. In fact, if you knew nothing about our message, what do you know about the experience of the 144,000 in this history? Is it a good experience or a bad experience? And I don't mean that they're worried that someone's going to come and kill them. I mean in their relationship with God. What is their standing according to their understanding, according to themselves, their own experience, in relation to God? 
Did they think they have a good, a good standing before God or a bad standing before Him? Bad. I mean, they're questioning their whole experience, aren't they? They don't even think that they're fit to be saved. They don't even know that they're saved. How can you know you're not saved if everyone around you is dead, you're the only people standing, the death decree has already been pronounced here, so you have a prophetic way mark, an event that identifies you here, you know you've given the third angel's message, you're successfully navigating through the Sunday law history, you haven't been killed, you're alive, and you've read the great controversy, you know that you're the 144,000, don't you? And don't you know that? So why are you having this bad experience? Maybe it's a mystery. Maybe we don't know. But we do know two things. That if you get to this stage, you're past, you're secure. But we also know that you're not going to have a good experience. Yes? But these SDAs are the same as the age here. So all of this experience that you're having here is all going to be here. So what I want us to see is that the priests go through this binding off, they'll go through this binding off, they'll go through this binding off, this one, and this one. Sin is so deep rooted in a person, it takes a lot of effort to get rid of it. And we're not even living sin from back here, remember? You know, sin, sometimes we just have this childish view of what sin is. You shout or you steal. Sin is deep rooted in us, it needs to be extricated. It takes an awful lot of effort on the part of God to do that, which is what all these binding knots, all these experiences are. So if you pass through this education process, then you need to go through this one to prepare you for this one. You go through this one to prepare you for this one. And then finally, you go through this one to prepare you for what? Living on this earth, free from all the cares and worries of what we've had in the past. <coughs> I'm running out of time, so I'm going to have to jump a few steps. Hopefully, this will make sense. When we think about the combining of two way marks, August 11th, 1840, April the 19th, 1844, why did we do that? Why do we combine those two way marks together? Remember our history. August 11, 1840, what way mark? Empowerment of the first angel. April the 19th, 1844, is what way mark? The arrival of the second angel. So you have the first and the second. Why do we combine them together? Because of the angel of Revelation 18 and Ellen White's comment that when the buildings of New York collapse, when they're brought down by, by the overturning of God's power, not man's, by the overturning of God's power, then Revelation 18 verses 1 to 3 will be fulfilled. And then we have this work of combining the two. So, if we had the first, second, and third step, and this was 1989, 9 11, 
midnight and midnight cry. <coughs> we often do this. Combine the first and the second, don't we? So I will take this out. Let's not worry about that. Let's think in terms This is Sunday law, this is the close of probation, and this is the second advent. Hold that thought, let me come here. Nine eleven, midnight, and the midnight cry. The first and second and the third. Yes? In this line, this is the line of the priests. <coughs> Where would we put the outpouring of the Holy Spirit? Now, I know often we talk about the latter rain, but I'm talking about the full outpouring, not the sprinkling. We're familiar with John chapter 20, when Christ breathed upon his disciples. He breathes upon them, which we call the sprinkling. The Pentecost we mark the outpouring of the Spirit. When does this outpouring happen here? Where would we mark? If I can use, if we can't, if I've never used this phraseology, that the sprinkling would be the former rain, and the outpouring would be the latter rain. Where would we mark the latter rain here? Right? Here? So my sister says here. Someone else? Someone says here. So, we'll, uh, we'll meet both people halfway and we'll say between here. Is that reasonable? So we'll put that terrain here. Is that what we would normally do? Yeah? You say this, you can keep worrying. And this is what? The binding of. Yeah? So let's jump over to here. Where's the lateral rain in this line? Where do we normally mark the lateral rain? <coughs> so we put the lateral rain here. Yeah? <coughs> let's pull back to this line. We've got the binding knot, the lateral rain. Where's the harvest in this line? Someone said midnight? A bit of grief for midnight? At a basic level, I know we could get complicated in this. We might have come up with different way marks, predicts before midnight, etc. Not looking at all of that. But where would we place the harvest? Okay, so we've got. Let me do it this way, like that. This is the harvest. Yes? We've got the harvest here. We've got the lateral rain here. So in this line, where do you place the harvest? Sorry? Same place? This is the harvest? So... This latter rain, who's it? Oh no, we'll do this one first. This latter rain, who's it being poured upon? You've got a choice? Priest, Levites, Nephilim, or 144,000? So this is the priest. This latter rain here, who's this latter rain being poured upon? Right? My sister said the Levites. Yeah. Some people say the eleventh hour workers, and some people say the Levites. So let's come back to this one. The latter rain is being poured upon the priests in the harvest. What's its purpose? 
Sorry? So the purpose of this latter rain on the priests is to ripen who? Is to ripen the priests before oh, not before obviously because it's after yeah it's already already been harvested so the latter rain of the priests is maybe we're not sure now let's come back to this one oh so the latter rain of the of the priest here in this harvest so now we're saying this is the latter rain of the eleventh hour workers. And what's this latter rain falling upon them for? What's its purpose? To ripen them for the harvest that's already begun. They've got no one to 
preach to. Okay, so let's, let's say if it's the 11th hour, because my sister said she didn't say it was the 11th. She had two opinions. There's the Levites, she said. <coughs> so the Levites now have got this latter rain of power. And who's their target audience? The Levitar workers. Levitar workers. <coughs> so does that sound a more reasonable proposition? Yeah? But the Levites aren't on their own, are they? They're with the priests. Priest. The priests haven't died. They're still around. So, the priests and the Levites, which we'll call SDAs. So, that rain is being poured upon SDAs, and their target group is the world. Does that seem to fit? Yes. We'll go with that. The 144,000, who are they made up of? <laughs> priests and Levites. Well, we've spoken about priests and Levites here, haven't we? Yeah? So, these priests and Levites who are doing this work in the latter rain, hold on to that thought. What is the purpose of that rain? To ripen? To ripen the harvest now for the harvest verb. Do we, do we know that we can use the word harvest as a noun and a verb? So, is this the harvest? Yes? Now, when you do this, is that harvest? Yes. Verb. It's an action and an object. So the latter rain is to ripen the harvest for, for the harvest. So the harvest means what? Collect everything together and put it in the barn. What's the barn? The heavenly garner. Let's just call it heaven. Or, a place of refuge. Yes? Are we going to be hid in the place of refuge during this period of the plagues? Yes? We're going to be protected from them. 144,000. So this garner is not just heaven in a literal sense, it's also a place of refuge or safety during this period here. So who's going to be collected all together and tucked away in the corner, shielded as a hen protects her chicks under her wings? Who's going to have that experience? 144,000. So the collection of the 144,000, the protection of them, to put them into this garner, happens when? Here? In Jacob's time of trouble. So this is the harvest of whom? The 144,000 which are made up of priests and Levites. But hold on, this is the finding off. So we have a problem, because now we're marking the latter rain before the binding off. Yeah? You've already developed a model here that the latch rain is the same time as the binding off. What binding off is this, by the way? The binding off of the priests, which we already said is the harvest of whom? Who's being harvested here? The priests. So if you're harvesting them, 
while it's raining. Is that going to work? It's not going to work. So, what's gone wrong here? The easiest place to go to would be this one. Because if you go to chapter 38, chapter 39, Ellen White will lay this out very clearly for you. But this is the sequence. Every Adventist knows the latter rain is from the Sunday law to the close of probation. Yeah? Everyone knows that. And everyone knows that during the seven last plagues, the 144,000 will be shielded and protected from that storm of violence that the Lord is going to allow to be unleashed upon the ungodly. We all know that. Yeah? This is the day of the Lord's judgment, beginning from this point all the way through. So in that judgment period, the 144,000 are shielded and protected, which means they have to be cut out of the world, totally separated from them, put in a particular place, which has all the characteristics of harvest. And we know that the latter rain is before that period, so we know that this sequencing is correct. Sometimes we get confused about the latter rain and its purpose. What is the purpose of latter rain? To ripen. Who's the harvest? In this story, the 144,000. How many groups do we have? One, two, three, four if we like, but we only have three groups. Because this group is nothing more than these two people. So this story here of the 144,000 should be teaching us about the history or the experience of the priests and the Levites and the 11th hour workers, because God's dealing with men is ever the same. Yes? Okay. So, this latter rain is for whom? The 144,000. Preceding the harvest. What would this way mark be? So, I suggest it's either be 9-11 or the time of the end. This is the latter rain. What precedes the latter rain? Former rain. So we have our sequence, our events that we're all familiar with, the sprinkling, the outpouring, the harvest, all done in a nice, simple fashion. Adventists wouldn't really accept these, would they? So we could put 1844 if we wanted to make them really happy. Yeah, we could do that. Because they would agree with this, this and this. They would agree with this and this. To binding off, they would prefer to say Jacob, time of trouble. But it's just language. Adventists are familiar with the sequencing of our reform line. What they don't like is taking all of this and bringing it into the present day experience experience to think that this is actually happening now so in conclusion uh, in summary we begin to lay out these steps of salvation we've got conviction got repentance, conversion, justification, sanctification and glorification. What we haven't mentioned is one more. So if we had conviction, repentance, conversion, justification, sanctification, glorification, what one have I missed out? If 
closer to Christ. Confession. And I don't believe it's a coincidence that we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven steps of salvation. These seven steps are just another application of the seven thunders. So, we want to read some spirit prophecy quotes just to see the relationship between these. So we've addressed this issue. We've looked at binding off. Once the binding off begins, which is the third step, the conclusion, it never ends until you get to the end. The end really is the third advent. He's binding off for the priests, the Levites, the Nephilims, the 144,000, and the whole of the saved race. We understand the work that's being done here. What work are we doing here? Reviewing? I don't think we're reviewing things. I don't think this is the process of reviewing. In our break, if I run out of time, I want us to think a little bit about what happens during this judgment, this millennial experience. This is the binding off, the binding off, binding off, binding off. You're binding off. So, if this was midnight, and this was midnight, and we said that you're going to be face to face with death as, David, as Daniel was, Daniel chapter 10, and Jacob was here, we begin to understand that the characteristics of this binding off are the same as this one, and this one, and this one, and this one. So if you want to understand what the experience of God's people here is, where would we go? Okay. okay. This one here. It's have a look at this one. I didn't understand what you said. It's a judgment of... Um, so we'll talk about it in our next presentation. Yes, 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 yes. Well, what is to see is a reform line is what? What is it? Symbol of judgment. The subject of the judgment is a complex subject that many of us are not fully conversant with. Even that's on the message. Let's pray.